Finbar Moore is my name and I'm a senior archaeologist in the National Monument Service and uh, head of the Underwater Archaeology Unit and um, I was directing the uh, recoveries and investigation here at Strida in 2015. My name is Connie Kelher. Um, I'm a member of the um, Underwater Archaeology Unit in the National Monument Service. Um, I was part of the dive team um, uh, that was carried out the dive project on the uh, the site of the Armada ship La Juliana. My name is Carl Reddy. I'm an archaeologist with the Underwater Unit in the National Monument Service, and I was one of the divers involved in the recovery of the cannon in 2015. The Armada site of Strida is extremely important, archaeologically, historically, from the point of view of naval architecture, etc. There are also a tangible link, just the wrecks here at Strida, to the wrecking event at the time, to the storms and the, uh, and the sort of tragedy that befell 26 odd ships of the Armada. And these three, because they're so tangible, so visible, so accessible, they really bring you right up. Uh, close to the story and to the events that we know uh, happened at that time were described and the, um, and the stories of Francisco de Quellar uh, who wrote that amazing account comes alive when you see the ships on the seabed. Um, the lead up to it really was when materials started to, the volume of material that was washed up on the beach over over the course of the past 20 years, we would have been monitoring that regularly, but only small artifacts had washed up. But when pieces of the rudder and, and that kind of material, size material, was washed up, we started to think the, the wreck must have been uncovered after the storms of 2014-15. So we went out in our, in our rib and we did geophysical survey, a site scan sonar, and we were able to see that there was material exposed on the bottom. We could see these long kind of uh, linear features and... Uh, kind of black areas that looked um, um, kind of interesting. So at low water, we were literally able to look beneath the surface with our batoscope and we could see the cannons lying on the seabed. So that then we started diving the site and we realised that an awful lot of the site was uncovered. So it was the last dive of the day and we had dived something like 30 plus locations and found nothing but sand and we were about to dive the last location, it was coming to the evening and we felt it was the least likely place for the wreck to be because it was so shallow. It was only something like two metres on the charts and we felt that the wreck might be out in deeper water. So as we approached the site we had our side scan sonar on and we started seeing these black splodges on the sonar so we knew there was something different about the seabed. And as we looked overboard to the side, we could see, again, dark patches in the water. It was so shallow, you could almost see the bottom, but it, the water wasn't quite clear. So I think I got the batoscope, and, um, which is basically a bucket with a glass bottom that enables you to see beneath the water. And I looked over and I just saw this cannon flash past us as the boat moved on. And um, I think we all kind of shrieked with joy that we'd possibly found one of the Armada sites. So there was a rush to get our dive gear on and um, one of our divers, Juliana, was the quickest and she was able to get in first. And it's kind of ironic that she, her name's Juliana and she was the first diver to dive on the Juliana in almost 30 years. That was a great moment. We just, because we'd known that we'd been over the site numerous times, I dived that site first maybe around 1999 and uh, we swam for hours and found nothing. And then suddenly just to look in, the, just to be able to look into the water and see the wreck and see the, the, the material spread there. It's, it's just one of those um, magical moments. That's the only way to describe it. And uh, we just, you know, you take sharp intake of breath and you say, well, we are onto something here. How are we going to deal with this? We've got to report back to Dublin, but this is a, there's a big job to be done here. So um, it was, uh, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was one of those moments. And then the local, dive club, the Sligo Tobacco Club, were diving not too far away from us. We were able to hail them and call them over and told them what we'd found. And for them, after 30 or 40 years nearly searching, 
it was a great moment for them as well. So, uh, yeah, celebrations all around, I think, was the only way of describing it. That was April when we kind of discovered that it was uncovered. And then in June of that year, we went back and did a whole load of recording, really to give us an idea of what we were dealing with. So we did rapid recording to get a sense of the nature and extent of the site. And then we started to do detailed recording so that we could start identifying artifacts in particular, because this was really a rescue excavation um, to rescue the vulnerable um, artifacts. Uh, I, I mean, it was incredible, really. Um, you know, you spend all your time reading about these this event and then 20 years monitoring it and it was never uncovered and... You wonder if you'll ever get to see it. And you saw, like, we had seen some of the material in the museum from the 1980s, but just to be able to see it up close was, uh, yeah, um, exciting and kind of awe-inspiring. But, uh, yeah, um, it's kind of an archaeologist's dream in one sense. But you kind of start thinking, God, how are we going to manage this material now? So you start trying to get realistic about it again, like so. We hadn't lifted anything on this scale before, especially the cannons. And uh, some of them weighed up practically over one and a half tons in weight, so that wasn't something we had um, we had any experience of. So we had to go back to the drawing board. But first of all, we had to go back to Dublin, report back on what we'd found, and and that there was quite a lot of material here, some of it very vulnerable, possibly to looting or just further abrasion from the elements with the increased storm activity. Some of the cannons you could see had already suffered severe abrasion over the centuries and others had just obviously been recently exposed and were in pristine almost. So we had to make the case that there was a job of work to be done here and the department rode in and provided funding for us to come back in July. And then we had to come back in July, we had to sort of put a plan in place, uh, uh, think about how we might approach, especially the recovery of the cannons and also survey the entire area that was exposed, the wreck, uh, the spread of cannonballs, the anchors, the, the carriage wheels, etc., and then recover what was most vulnerable. So um, our dive supervisor, Rob, who is very technically minded, came up with a system of recovering the cannons with uh, creating a pontoon with airbags and a weight on the surface and uh, acting as a counterweight to the cannons and the pulley system. Uh, that could bring us up and on onto a boat, but we also needed to get a, a boat that would lift at least two tons. So we found Dula Namara in Black Sod, Anthony Irwin's boat with an A-frame in the back, which was supposedly capable of lifting up to two tons. So we came back in in June and lifted two of the guns more to test the waters and, and to put the the sort of program or the action plan we had in mind. In, in, in place in terms of recording and recovery and that worked very well so that set us up then for coming back in July for the best part of a month to undertake the other recoveries. Well in, in many ways Strida is a dream site because it's shallow, the water is generally clear um, and it's not too too far from Mullock Moor. You're just you know, a 40 minute ride out in the boat, so you can get to it relatively easily. But because it is shallow and it's located relatively close to the shore, it also suffers from um, from being in a, in a quite a dynamic area in relation to the currents and the swell. Especially if there's a northwesterly blowing in, you can get quite rough there. Uh, at times, you can almost be in a surf zone, especially at low tide, when the waves can be crashing over. And that can make it more difficult to stay in place on a on a job or when you're maybe excavating a cannon or you're using a suction dredge and you have all this, this big tube connected to another boat, to the boat, and your old umbilical is connected to the boat and that's dragging and you're getting pulled in the currents and you're getting pulled off, off the location where you're working. And that can be frustrating and challenging and also has potential dangers if it's not managed properly. Um, Visibility was generally good, but I say at times when it gets windy, the sand and silt would stir up and it could make it more difficult to see stuff, to photograph stuff. Um, and then when you're lifting the guns, you want to do that on a calm day because when you lift the gun off the seabed and it's been held by these floating airbags, um, the gun bounces up and down with the waves. And if you get caught underneath that, you could have a one and a half ton gun coming crushing down on your leg or, or your equipment or something like that. So 
it was always safety first and then try and keep the artifact as safe as possible. But we only lift it when it was safe to do so and when the weather allowed us. Um, so that's why it's not always straightforward. Um, some guns were very easy to lift and the one, other guns just took a bit longer due to the conditions. I'm dive safety officer, so I kind of work closely with our dive supervisor to ensure that everything was done um, according to, uh, you know, the old adage, we planned our dives and we dived our plan, basically, um, and that everything ran smoothly. And then we had our other colleagues then that we contracted in to augment our team, um, and they all had individual roles. Um, one archaeologist was the task with recording the material, and the other archaeologists would be measuring and recording, and then certain um, kind of um, expertise were stropping them and making sure that they were able, we were able to recover them. So we we all kind of had our individual roles, but it was all part of a team, really. We initially allocated two weeks for 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 the job to lift five guns, um, but as soon as we, I think as soon as we begun, we found another gun, and then towards the end of. The second week, a mini summer storm kind of blew in and blew us off side for a day. And we came back, the tip of another gun was just sitting there on the, on the seabed where we'd been swimming over day after day, multiple times. So, and as we ex- began to excavate that gun, uh, we found another gun underneath it. Um, so it was never kind of changing scenario on the seabed and we constantly had to ask for an extension after extension. Um, and then towards the end of the third week we found another gun in an area again which we'd fully surveyed um i think it was a san sebastian gun um just sitting there lying there waiting to be to be lifted so yeah it was an ever changing scenario which we had to react to kind of from day to day really first of all we saw this kind of little bit of lead sheeting coming out of the seabed and we thought it was lead sheeting that would have been part of maybe the whole structure um but then it was actually one of the divers ed moran and uh john moody called me over that identified that it was actually far bigger than a sheet of of bronze uh, and it turned out to be a cauldron and um a beautiful beautiful um artifact um bell shaped almost and uh, one of th- possibly three cauldrons that would have been on a ship like La Juliana. And what's interesting is that it's, there's still residue of tar in it. So it was the, the cauldron we, we were surmising that would have been used for repair of the ship, probably if there was a leak or whatever. So it's, uh, there's very little cauldrons found from shipwrecks around the world. So it's an important item from the ship. Yeah, that was that was another extraordinary. That was almost as good as when we first spotted the Juliana because um, the crowd that gathered that morning was extraordinary. There must have been 200 people on the pier and photographing them and then touching them as if they were relics, which in a way they are, because and they all had the pictures of saints on them and it was like touching history. And so many people wanted to just put a hand in them. And I suppose it's because it was a story that was so told so often locally and was part of the local folklore and the local history and to actually see it come ashore and to touch it for us it was just it was a major moment like we just were delighted with that that that, that we'd done that and that that opportunity had been given and for us it was a privilege to bring them ashore like that and it was a fantastic morning we'll never uh, never forget it they're all beautiful the saint peter gun which is a demi cannon which is the largest gun, on, on, on which we found, um, and the largest functioning gun on the ship, um, um, that is really a beautiful um, uh, piece of, of artillery, and it has the uh, Saint Peter kind of moulded on as a decoration, onto the the the, the, re, the reinforcement of of the cannon, and um, has this beautiful flame decoration. Uh, little semicircular decorations and some some foliage on it as well. So it really is kind of a, a beautiful gun, very well made, and these really ornate lifting dolphins. So basically these lifting handles to carry the gun, to lift the gun from place to place, onto the ship or off the ship, or if it was used on land. Each gun tells its own story, and the very kind of 
the saint motifs alone are kind of the way of almost Christianizing the guns and, you know, bringing God is coming with them while, while, when the guns are on board. That, you know, you could have a whole layer of how you would view that, the saint, saintly figures on the guns, you know. To get the depiction, the date of manufacture, and we know that the Giuliano was made in 1570, and to have 1570 in Roman numerals on each and every one of the guns was just sort of driving home the message. And then to see the, the saints and the symbols that they, and, and what they represent, because these were mostly martyrs that were depicted on the guns. So there was definitely a great veneration for martyrs and a great faith put in martyrs that they might keep them safe, not only against pirates and corsairs in the Mediterranean, but also, you know, from the, uh, the heathen uh, Ottomans, uh, Turks, and the, um, as they would have seen them. And the uh, and the, and the, the heathen Protestant English as well at that stage. So uh, there was um, there was, but uh, sadly for them, uh, uh, the, their their look ran out, or the the power of these uh, the, these um, saints depicting the guns ran out when they hit the Atlantic storms off the west coast. And the guns are in the museum now, uh, with our colleagues in the National Museum and the Conservation uh, Department. And uh, they're in tanks. They've been in there now since 2015, and they should be close to being fully conserved. And that's a process of desalination, where um, it's it's an they go through what electrolysis, where it takes the salt out of the actual iron and the bronze, and um, that stops it corroding or or um, um, breaking down so um but they, the guns all the material actually from the ship or the shipwreck was in very good condition it was maybe two of the guns that showed fairly severe abrasion where the saint the figures of the saints were well um well uh, eroded or you know abraded but overall the, the quality of the material is superb so um so yeah so the, they'll stay in the tanks until they're fully desalinated and then they'll be uh, they'll be put on display. The process is for the guns. It's fairly simple process. It's just that uh, you can't let them dry out. If you let them dry out, the salts that have accumulated in the metal will expand and crack and crack the guns. You know, so it's extraordinary how uh, over the centuries how much uh, they have salinated or absorbed salt into the metal. So the process of desalination is an ongoing one of just putting them in tanks of fresh water, uh, leaving them there for maybe a month or so, draining the tanks, cleaning the uh, any, anything that's leached out of the metal uh, off the guns, filling the water again, and uh, re re keeping that process going until such time as there's nothing leaching out of the guns. Then you know they've stabilised and that... Uh, where the salt was now, they're 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 they've um, stabilized, and then the next uh, part of the process is to uh, to clean any other um, uh, accretions that might have uh, formed on them. But it's a fairly gentle process because, especially with these guns, these cannons, because by and large they're they're in really good condition. So it's just a question of slowly desalinating and then uh, lightly cleaning and. Uh, then they're ready to be presented. The conservation process for the gun carriage wheel has been very slow and very tedious and very difficult work. And Hannah Power and National Museum um, has spent many days slowly working away on the gun carriage. Um, I suppose one surprise, well, it wasn't really a surprise, but there was a cannonball attached to the corrosion and the concretion on the, the gun. And we um, were able to, Hannah was able to take that off uh, very delicately and that gave us the opportunity to then go and measure it and weigh it. And we know that that's probably a, a two pound cannonball that um, may have been used in one of the smaller guns of the Falconets and possibly the San Giovanni gun, which was the first gun we lifted. I think ideally they would be displayed somewhere close to where the story of the Armada can be told as well and can be illustrated both uh, through the various uh, 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 various methods that are available through through um, audio video or through through displays appropriate displays and also uh, where the landscape can tell the story as well 
Um, so I think this, this area of, of County Sligo is ideal and hopefully the resources will be made available to build a facility that can actually put them on display and become a centre for the story of the, of the Armada. And um, it's, a, it's a also it's a site that has to be managed and, and, and assessed over the year, in year for, for the foreseeable future. You know, it's not just work for us, but in years to come, I'd say there'll be work there for archaeologists for a long time. And as material is brought ashore, there is a need for a conservation facilities. So it would be nice if conservation facilities were tied in with a, a, a facility that could display a, a material from, the, from these wrecks and tell the story of the Armada nationally and internationally.